so welcome everyone to Reform's second online panel event uh, since the start of this confinement. I'm Eleonora Harwich, Director of Research at Reform. And today's panel will be addressing uh, some very topical and important questions on what are the next steps for the NHS and how to build a more resilient healthcare system. Uh, please do tweet about this event. The hashtag is hashtag NHS resilience. It will actually be the main channel through which people who are not able to attend this event uh, right now will be able to follow the conversation. So please be altruistic and do tweet about this event. Um, to answer this question is I have an absolutely brilliant panel with me uh, with George Batchelor, who's co-founder of Edge Health and trained like me in the dismal science of economics. Um, and used to work in consulting prior to founding um, Edge Health. We also have Dr. Claire Gerada, who is a GP and former chair of the Royal College of General Practice. And she was actually the first female chair of the Royal College of General Practice and is now also co-chair of the NHS Assembly. And last but not least, we have Dr. Axel Heitmuller, who's the managing director at Imperial College Health Partners. Um, Axel also did a stint in uh, central government working in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit and at number 10. Um, I will let the panelists further introduce themselves in a little bit, but I was thinking while we wait for everyone to kind of finally uh, join the webinar on what are the next steps for the NHS, how to build a more resilient healthcare system, I thought that I would um, start by um, having a little poll um, about a question that I will ask um, the panelists quite uh, shortly. It's a very, very crucial question of who is actually still wearing their pajama bottoms? Um, actually, I'm, I'm just kidding, um, although it is a crucial question, but more seriously, I wanted to understand what your views were uh, in terms of the fragilities that we have seen in the healthcare system. And I wanted to know basically your views on what you think um, this pandemic has highlighted as the biggest fragilities. So you will soon see a little um, poll uh, window pop up on uh, your screens. Um, so you have obviously several options uh, for which you can vote. Panelists are more than welcome to cast their votes. Obviously, I haven't been able to provide an exhaustive list of all of the reasons uh, why some system or sorry why um, some system fragilities have been uh, highlighted. So apologies for having missed um, some of these, but I just thought we would we would do that uh, while we wait for more people to log in. So as a reminder uh, for those just joining us now, I'm Eleanor Harwich, Director of Research at Reform Think Tank, and I will be chairing. Uh, today's panel on what are the next steps for the NHS and how to build a more resilient healthcare system. You should see on your screen right now a little pop-up uh, box asking you to cast your votes on a question which is what are the biggest system fragilities that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has revealed about the healthcare system. We have now about 75% of votes um, that have come in. So we'll just wait a little bit until everyone casts their vote and we i can see that we have more people joining which is great um and just as a reminder please do tweet about this event the hashtag is nhs resilience so quite interesting so for now we have fragmentation within the healthcare system coming up as the kind of top system fragility um as a close second, the lack of capacity in terms of, you know, workforce, number of beds and, and ventilators. We're at 83% of vote casted. So for those of you just joining us, we have launched a short little poll um, and you can cast your votes. It's a multiple choice actually, so you can vote for several options. I will just wait a tiny little bit. Okay, great. Well, with about 82% of vote casted, 84, 85, okay. I'm soon gonna close uh, the votes and share with you the results before officially kicking off the event. Great, so I think for now, percentages have remained quite stable. So I will end the vote and share the results with you. Um, so now you should see the results appear um, on your screen. So 
72% uh, of you think that one of the biggest fragilities that this crisis has highlighted about the health and care system is actually the system fragmentation, um, which is quite interesting. So I will now uh, stop sharing these results and we will come on to this question um, that I will ask the panelists to answer. There we go. Um, so now let's um, officially kick off the event. Um, so the COVID-19 has obviously been a ginormous challenge for healthcare systems around the world who have had to completely reorganize how they work um, at, to be able to respond to the crisis as COVID response became uh, the priority and either everything else was dropped or delayed. Obviously, this is not universally the case, but it has happened in most places. The NHS has had uh, obviously some big difficulties around supply chain and the provision of personal protective equipment. Um, yet we have also seen some great uh, successes, uh, for example, the introduction of um, greater, uh, sorry, more flexible guidelines around uh, data sharing to fight the pandemic. We have also seen the implementation now um, at scale of telehealth, both in primary and secondary care. Um, we have, you know, managed to see incredible feats such as building Nightingale hospitals in about 10 days, or albeit potentially a, a little bit too uh, late. But in the coming months, um, I think we will obviously see public inquiries as to how the pandemic was handled. So I'm actually quite keen that during this event, we focus not so much, or at least not too much on what has already um, happened, but that we really focus um, on looking at the future and really where the NHS should go from here and how it will manage to bounce back from this crisis and what will the new normal um, look like. So to answer these complex questions, I have a fabulous panel with me. So as I mentioned, George Batchelor, who is co-founder of Edge Health, uh, Dr. Claire Gerarda, who is a GP and co-chair of the NHS Assembly, and Dr. Heit Muller, who's a managing director at Imperial College um, Health Partners. So we will have a chair discussion for the next 20 minutes um, or so, and then we will be taking questions from the audience. Actually on your screen, you should see at the kind of bottom uh, of your screen, a little um, option that says Q&A. So please do post your questions uh, in that little Q&A box, a colleague and myself will be monitoring these questions. Uh, so just as a note, please do keep your questions relatively short because my colleague and myself will be reading them uh, throughout the event to try and make sure that we can then integrate them once we uh, reach the kind of Q&A bit of the uh, session. So also if you do see my eyes moving around, it's not that I'm not paying attention, it's just that I'm trying to monitor several things. Um, at the same time, and hopefully once we reach the q and A, I I will manage to seamlessly integrate all of these questions and, and ask them um, to the panel. So um, I will now let the panel further introduce themselves uh, and potentially give their brief thoughts on the NHS's pandemic response and potentially maybe how they think that the reprioritization exercise will impact the NHS in the near future. So you can decide which bits of the question you, you'd like to to address um, so that we can basically provide a bit of context and then fully focus for the rest of the event um, on kind of some, some future thinking. Um, so George, could I potentially ask you to start and then I will go to Claire and finally to Axel. Thanks Ellie. I think you've already done quite a good introduction for me so I won't say too much more. Uh, but my name is George Batchelor. I'm a co-founder of Edge Health. Um, in terms of just picking up Ellie's question, I think that it's fair to say that the last eight weeks or so have seen possibly the biggest response the NHS has ever had to a single issue. And we saw things like the Nightingale get built in 10 days. Um, but I think with some degree of hindsight now, um, a lot of the demand that was anticipated uh, didn't really manifest. And largely, not everywhere, but largely the capacity was there to meet the demand um, that actually came. And that's that's not least because of the effects of things like the lockdown and social distancing. I think in, in terms of the reprioritization, and, and this is very much based on some of the work that we did over the last few weeks, um, I think everyone was expecting a lot more demand um, to hit the system. And, and largely speaking, although capacity did drop, uh, the demand for normal services plummeted. So for things like cancer, where we were particularly worried about um, some of the, uh, the activity that was presenting not getting delivered. And um, what we've actually seen is 
a much bigger drop off in the level of demand. Now, that's not to say that that's a good good outcome because presumably a lot of this demand does still exist. It just hasn't shown yet. Um, but for example, we saw 80% drop in two week rate referrals. Um, so the NHS capacity was able to meet the demand that came. Going forward, I think there's a real importance on actually getting the demand to come back up as well as, uh, as, well as on the capacity side. Great, thank you, George. Claire, could I go to you? Ooh. Sorry, you have to unmute yourself, Claire. A rookie yeah. error. <laughs> <laughs> we had 10,000 Zoom calls in the last eight weeks. Anyway, thank you very much. So I'm Claire Gerrard, I'm a GP and uh, co-chair of the Assembly, but I'm actually speaking here in my capacity as a GP. I think, and, and yes, of course, inquiries will tell us how we've done, but I disagree completely with the poll that was taken, that was forward. I think what has shown over the last 10, 12 weeks is how remarkable the NHS was and how connected it was. Rather than a fragmented, fragmented service, it actually was a service that was able to unite, able to share resource, share people, share PPE, share thinking, right across, not just within organisations, but right across organisations and initiatives that have uh, we, we've wanted for, for, for decades uh, around allowing staff to move more freely between one trust and another, allowing joint working across community and primary care. We have seen years of transformation happen in a few short weeks. So I think what we've done, where I think we will look back isn't about the NHS, and yes, of course, George is right about capacity, and I think there are issues around that. I think where it will look back is on the reliance, if you like, of, of the expert, uh, rather than, dare I say that as a so-called expert, rather than uh, a sense of where we use the expert to inform policy, but policy has to be, in the end, taken by our politicians with, with the experts. But also around what we saw at the beginning, which was the mistrust around PPE, which is nothing I hasten to add, or very little to do with the NHS, uh, it's not bits to do, but around uh, securing the provision was not necessarily in the NHS's hands. So I think what we've seen over the last few weeks, and I agree with George about uh, a, a reduction in in essential services, and we need to reset that because I don't want my patients dying of cancer. But I think what we've also seen, which we mustn't lose sight of, is the removal of the paternalistic health system. And I think the NHS got far too paternalistic in removing individuals' ability to cope and having a, a, a place in the wanting a place in the table when in fact communities could do it themselves and they've been shown to do it themselves. So looking back, I think we'll see some errors, but of course we will have seen errors. I agree with George around not having enough data, but I think we will look back and see how remarkable the NHS did cope and how the, the problems that we've seen aren't necessarily to do with the NHS but to do with the external factors. Great, thank you very much Claire and Axel, finally. Thank you very much and this must be the first panel that has absolutely no bookshelves anywhere to be seen, which must be a first. Um, th thanks for having us um, and uh, I, I absolutely uh, sort of agree with, with most of the things that have just been said. We, we embedded our team for the last two months uh, in gold control in one part of London. So we have been um, working very closely uh, alongside operational colleagues to, um, you know, sort of in, in part achieve some of the um, capacity expansion and coordination that, that was mentioned earlier. Um, and, you know, it, it's been a, a very humbling experience to see um, how the NHS came together um, uh, across boundaries, right, and, and and also it should be stressed across sort of boundaries that uh, in the past have been very very difficult to to bridge. So including local authorities um, and and also the third sector. So the collaboration has been fantastic, despite it actually being quite a fragmented um, system. I suppose the the sort of really interesting trade-off that we probably should discuss a bit is, in many ways, you always assume it's a national healthcare system and it can pull a few levers. Uh, and that's very different from if you look at the United States or if you look at Germany, um, uh, where it's much more difficult in a, in, a, in a truly fragmented policy space as well to actually get something done. It should be much easier in the NHS. And, and so in part it was, but in other parts, it was also incredibly difficult. So take testing. 
I think we didn't test enough because we relied, we overly relied on central control while other countries um, used a much broader set um, uh, and, and base of testing labs um, in the community to actually get some of these things done. So there, there, there's a question for me as to whether actually a centralized system had any advantages or whether it was predominantly a disadvantage. I can see in other areas it potentially has advantages in terms of a supply chain for PPE. Now that didn't work either particularly well and we should unpack that. But I think the other area which I think we were absolutely surprised by um, was the lack of information to guide decision making. So the NHS is fantastic at collecting all kinds of data all the time. There's not a shortage of, you know, um, templates and SIDRAPs and, you know, all kinds of stuff gets collected daily. But when it came to it, this information was predominantly useless. It was the wrong information. It was contradictory. Uh, it, and, and I think what it showed to us was we collect data, but we, we have almost no ability at the moment to turn this into actionable information. And the data that gets collected is collected by people who have lost connectivity with why are we actually collecting this data and therefore the quality of what's collected is not good enough um, because it's predominantly collected for uh, sort of performance management purposes rather than operational kind of you know strategic questions i think that was you know one of the biggest surprises for us and, and probably one of the biggest sort of you know risks in 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 in, in the system going forward because without good information we can't get to some of the questions that, that George and um, Claire have raised in terms of how we you know, progress and how we get back um, into the waiting list and so on. Thank you. So, um, so that's actually very interesting. And I think in, in your blog, you mentioned uh, that quite succinct quote, which I think is, is really great, uh, which is data rich, but information poor, ultimately, that the, the kind of system is. And do you think that that's kind of the, the main fragility that you actually see in, in, in the system? No, it's not the it's not the main one. It's it's a it's a huge one because look, um, every day, literally over the last two months, operational colleagues have tried to establish how many beds they have, how many staff they have, how many ventilators they have, how much PPE, and you know I think I've said this before. This is sort of at the moment the equivalent of a big supermarket chain effectively collecting information on how many items of potatoes they have on the shelf uh, manually every morning in every branch, right? And um, it, that is surprising. You know, we, we cannot answer simple questions as to how many beds we have every morning. And, and so basically that, that, can, that would benefit hugely from technology and you know, um, uh, other means of, of doing it. But fundamentally, it's, as usual, it's not the technology that's the issue here. The issue is that I think for years we didn't ask meaningful questions of data, right? There was almost no requirement to, to, to drive the NHS in an information data driven way. And that radically changed over the last few months because suddenly we needed this information, right? Every single bed, every piece of equipment, every ventilator mattered in a way that probably before it didn't quite to the same extent. Certainly not at a systems level, maybe at an organizational level, but certainly not at the system. Um, uh, and I, I think they're in nice and massive opportunity. You know, if you fix that, you can unlock some of these other things along the supply chain in, in terms of longer term planning and, and ensuring that actually the right things are in the right place. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, and so actually now moving on a bit to, to I guess, the, some of the silver linings around uh, the kind of COVID pandemic. It has also brought about a lot of um, rapid changes. I think some of the um, attendees also noted that in the, in the Q&A questions that, you know, there has been a lot of system change and like uh, Claire mentioned, a lot of collaboration. Uh, there have been more uh, remote uh, consultations, rapid adoption of uh, telehealth, greater data sharing. I guess, what are the most interesting changes that you have seen and what lessons can we draw from this uh, in terms of, you know, I guess the, the changes that we would like to see uh, the system keep moving uh, forward. So Claire, I will go on to you first. And actually, I prepared a, another little poll uh, for our audience on uh, this topic. So let me just um, select it so that while you answer, um, there we go. So you should have a, a second poll, but while, while you answer, Claire, um, uh, attendees will be able to, to kind of respond to, to that poll. So what, what are for you the kind of biggest lessons that we can draw in terms of 
the factors that drive change and the things that we would like to keep or see yeah. moving forward? I mean, it, it, it's a vast answer. And I'm not going to spend on it because there's been masses and I know that people are looking at this. I mean, for me, if I just look at the workforce, let's just look at workforce, for example, there have been enormous changes in how we innovate and deliver transformations, enormous changes in how we work together, the use of skill mix, people working at the top of their license. I'll give you a tiny example. Speech and language therapists now being able to insert nasogastric tubes. Healthcare assistants able to give insulin to patients at home. These are things that would have taken us 10 years of consultation and have happened in a, in a matter of weeks. We've also, uh, as you've said, delivered difference in telehealth. I, I think we've got to be very careful because people, I think, and I have a conflict of interest here because we, uh, my practice has created e-consult, but we've got to be careful because video doesn't address demand. It's just a new way of delivering face-to-face -face, as we've seen through Zoom. But what we have seen is the rapid adoption of, of all forms of digital health. And I've heard uh, consultants saying, how amazing it is that they're using the telephone to do outpatients. Well, you know, that's great. So we've actually moved probably again a decade forward. We've also, and many of people who are from the healthcare system will know this, we've, we've done something that I have taken, worked on for 12, 13 years to try and produce a system where the staff who work in the NHS are as valued as the patients that they look after and to produce a well-being uh, agenda for staff and we've seen that through the, the rise of group support, of, of welfare rooms, of supervision and, and my god that has taken years and it is probably the single most uh, intervention that is going to help address the, the further down the track uh, burnout and, and all the, the issues. And finally we've seen uh, in terms of workforce uh, changes to how, not just how people work but we've seen blurring of the uh, professional roles that people have. So if you look in hospitals again, it, it's, it's your skill, not where you come from. And that has taken decades. So there are masses that we, we've, we've changed. And the one thing that we need to do before too late is to capture all of this and to capture the patient's experience of it, because it's all very well saying it's happened, but what do patients feel? So we need to capture it in a systematic way and capture the, the patient experience, and then from there to grow uh, and to, 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 to try and embed some of those permanently. Thanks, Claire. I will just publish the, the results from the, from the poll uh, now. So actually, oop, there we go, share the results. Uh, so many people actually agree with you around the kind of new ways of working and, and delivering care uh, differently. Um, George, would you have anything to, to add to, to, to that question? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting because I guess the perception is that there's been this massive uptick in use of remote consultations. I do think a lot of that has been on the telephone rather than through video platforms per se. And my understanding is that one of the biggest changes underlying that is the way of working rather than the technology itself. So there have been challenges with some of the technology and using it and learning how to use it. But actually, the biggest challenge has been actually how do you change the way of working around that i think the second thing i would would add is that we don't really know yet whether it's had a positive impact i think the the the, the there's certainly some goodness that will come out of it but we don't really know the impact it will have on health inequalities um whether it actually will improve the efficiency of the system um and whether it's you know actually going to lead to better quality outcomes or or, or okay outcomes um, because some of this might just shift activity down the down the road a bit. Thank you very much. And actually, I guess a, a question related to this topic is ultimately why did it have to take a pandemic of of this kind of magnitude for these changes to occur at such pace or to be able to kind of concentrate minds on system transformation uh, this way? Maybe could I go to to Axel to answer this question? Yeah, no, not an insignificant question. Um, can I just say, I, I absolutely agree actually with what George just said. I'm, I'm, uh, we, we must not waste this opportunity to learn from what has happened, right? And 
um, that there now needs to be a very rapid um, mobilization of sort of action learning uh, exercises. Um, yeah, there, there has been a tremendous response in the in the research community to this, particularly around you know vaccines and you know some of the sort of bigger research questions. What I haven't seen yet is the same energy around uh, operational evaluation that needs to happen. Right? We we still don't know what treatment, for example, in which ICU worked and was more effective. But that's sort of by the by. Um, I, I think that's a big task uh, to be done. Now, what, why did it take a, a, a pandemic? I, I, I think this sort of takes us into um, a, a conversation about why change happens, right? And, and change happens um, be, because either there is motivation, that you need some capabilities, and you also need some opportunities. And these three things have come together in a quite unique way over the last two uh, to three months. So the motivation was there quite clearly. You know, we th there wasn't a question as to whether we needed to change. We had to change, because otherwise we potentially would have been overrun. Um, uh, and you know, despite the fact that there are empty ICU beds, um, that was only after a massive expansion of ICU beds. Uh, so, so there was there was something absolutely mission critical um, that needed to happen. So they, and and also I think not to be underestimated, it affected all of us, right? staff in the same way as kind of, you know, citizens not involved in the NHS, this kind of, you know, all in this together element uh, made a huge difference to motivation. Secondly, around the kind of opportunities, um, it does help if suddenly money is, is no longer an option, uh, no longer a constraint, right? Because there were no questions asked, and there will be questions asked at the end of this, but suddenly you could procure things when you needed them. You didn't need to fill in long business cases. Um, in, in order to get stuff sh shifted. Uh, and, and suddenly this freedom that was there, um, the lack of bureaucracy, the kind of, you know, we, we can get this done if we really want to, um, you know, clearly helped um, tremendously. And then I think there were also um, a lot of capabilities, uh, and Claire uh, alluded to this earlier, that, that came together. It wasn't just the NHS that delivered this. You know, there were, there were abilities and capabilities that came from other sectors um, that were pulled into this. Um, the bigger question for me is, how can you keep this up, right? Because we have tried to do change for a long time. Um, and we have written all kinds of strategies and plans. And quite frankly, not a lot of that has happened. So, so the question really is, how can you keep up this, this mission? Um, and, you know, you alluded to the blog that I did a while ago. I deeply believe that one, I mean, so A, we haven't really come out of the crisis. George alluded to it earlier. We now have millions of patient appointments that we need to get through. That's a healthcare crisis, right? And that has potentially much, much bigger impact on mortality and well-being over the years to come. So we're not out of the crisis, and we should probably maintain a sense of urgency that would help. But fundamentally, I believe we need to kind of, and this comes also back to transparency and data, we should be much more transparent with patients about outcomes and what good looks like, so that actually there is a bit of you know, pressure bottom up from citizens to, to hold our feet to the fire and make sure that, that we create a healthcare system that delivers. Um, uh, and we haven't tried that, right? We have tried top down and we have tried sort of targets and all that kind of stuff hasn't really given us the transformation. I think we haven't tried enough to be transparent about outcomes and um, the quality of the services that we deliver. Thank you. Actually, that touches on a, on a couple of themes that um, have emerged from the Q&A um, questions that our attendees have been sending. So I guess one of them is around, you know, how, how, how are we going to deal with this whole backlog and, and, and how are we going to kind of prioritize decision making around this? And then there's another one around kind of patient engagement and the experience and how and how we reinvent the new normal uh, with patients. So could I potentially go to Claire to address the point around uh, kind of how do we keep patients engaged and then maybe to George about the kind of million dollar question of how do we deal with all of the backlog? Yeah, I mean, again, I want to go back to the point that I think we underestimate patients and the public and what the pandemic has done is it's shown, as Axel was saying, the bottom up, you know, how, what was it, half a million volunteers in, in the space of six days? Yeah. and. I have worked long enough in the NHS when we had a bottom up with a top down meeting in the middle. And I think we became far too top down. The, if the NHS didn't sanction it, it couldn't happen to the point that you couldn't go to a gym. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm slightly being flippant here, but it felt like as a GP, you couldn't go to the gym unless you had a doctor's letter. 
you couldn't do a, a walk in the park unless the doctor had sorted out walks in the park. And we became to a point that we'd forgotten that people had their own resources, communities have their own resources, and people have their own resources. And I do accept that we've seen a shortfall, and of course we've got to bring that back. You know, immunizations have dropped, uh, two week referrals have dropped. But also what we had was uh, we'd, we'd put into the public, we'd, we'd taken away their coping skills. And we said, you know, if you cough, you've got to seek help. If you do this, you've got to seek help. You've got to splinter, you've got to seek help. Rather than say, draw on your own resources and we're there for you, which is, I think, what's been happening now, certainly within my wider range of people that I, I know. And I think we've got to capitalise on that. What I don't want to go back to is the NHS just trying to do everything for everybody at all times and getting into spaces that I think it shouldn't be in and to allow the system to become what I think is a sort of national sickness service really with of course prevention around the edges in terms of in that and I am going to touch on the digital bit a bit George and slightly agree and disagree yes you're right the vast majority has been telephone and we need to move away but what we've got to do is to use digital in order to reduce demand and to allow patients, if you like, to have a quicker way into the system. Video is not going to do that. It's just another way of face to face, as I've said before. But I am hopeful around digital because there's one thing that we're not going to do in our own practice is to go back to how things were. And we've, we've got to also build on, we're not waiting from orders from above. None of us are waiting. My practice isn't waiting for the government to say you must do. We are starting to have discussions ourselves around how, what should we retain, what should we do going forward, what didn't work. So the plea is let patients and the public become empowered again, let us in the service become empowered again. Let's have, of course, some top-down uh, guidance and, and, and high level, but it will work if we, if we allow the system to, to, to do what it has done in the past, which is to respond to the best way it can to the needs of its patient population. Thanks, Claire. And uh, George, big question, how do we deal with the backlog? <laughs> so I agree with what Claire's saying about the, um, the need for sort of more localised responses. And I think it's quite similar to what Axel was saying earlier about the German experience. I think the fact that there's been sort of more regional accountability has helped their testing regime. And I think that is part of the answer to the, the billion dollar or billion pound question, which is um, there is a massive backlog of activity. Um, no one's really getting any direction of how that's going to be delivered or when it's going to be delivered. Um, almost by design, it's impossible for 18 weeks to be delivered anymore uh, because of the, the delay that, that has happened. Um, so there's, some, there's definitely something about local systems taking some responsibility in how they're going to deliver that. Um, one of the key areas is obviously going to be around case prioritization, so risk stratification. Um, so who needs uh, care the most urgently and the treatment most urgently. Um, but there's also something around how the NHS can work with a broader ecosystem. So it can't, I think we have to move, I, I guess, move away from seeing the health service as the NHS and seeing it as a broader ecosystem with independent sector, private organizations, um, social care and, and many other different parts working together. And I think, you know, just sort of building on Axel's point again, having some really solid data that everyone buys into and actually can help answer some of the really difficult questions and, and trust would, would be a really big helpful start in articulating the need and value of doing that. Thanks, George. And actually, um, one popular topic uh, that has been mentioned here in the Q&A, which made me think of, of, of a bit of your response, Claire, which is obviously the, I guess, the fact that the pandemic has laid bare um, issues around healthcare inequalities. Um, and I know, Claire, that that um, in kind of previous discussions that we have had, you obviously think that a lot of the things that can be done to tackle these issues um, have to do with areas that are actually completely outside of healthcare, and that yes. are, like healthcare should almost be the last port of call for these things. So how how would you integrate, obviously, plans to be able to deal with some of these issues uh, when they present themselves in healthcare? And, and how do you think the government should potentially have a, a more, um, dare I say, kind of global approach or holistic approach to, to, to the issue of healthcare inequalities? Uh, it's a, that's a vast question, but if I just 
break it down before others come in. Uh, what, what I've always thought of as a GP is that I'm a social, local change agent. My role is to have a, a relationship with my community. It's to, so if there's, you know, areas like, like many moons ago, there was terrible rubbish building up in some of our, in some, and I worked with others in the local community, with the local uh, uh, councillors to try and address that. And I think what we've got to do is to bring things local again. Of course, we have to have government of course we do but we bring things local we allow gps the time and the space to do the work and to do what they're good at which is is as local social entrepreneurs we allow our local councils to be properly funded so they have the headspace to do that and then we we, we engage our local communities as we did before to be able to produce the changes that are needed at local level i think what we've had for the last decade is we're all running around in a hamster wheel doing things that are either non-evidence based and get us annoyed because we know we're only doing it to tick the boxes and and in a sense to not because they make any difference or we're seeing issues in our local communities that are begging for small amounts of resource with our fabulous local councillors and local government unable to do that because they don't have the resource so if if any and we've seen the health system as the sort of gobbling up all, all the money because those who shout loudest get the most so i don't know we talk about the reset button what i would like genuinely and honestly is the reset looking back towards our local government to having the resources the funding and dare i say more gps able to spend longer with their patients and their communities working with our communities to bring about the changes that are necessary thank you very much so actually there, there have been quite a few questions um, talking specifically about uh, BAME communities and how potentially healthcare services have not always kind of taken the speci specific uh, needs of these communities into account or serve these communities in 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 the best um, possible way Axel how how do you think that we can ensure that that's not the case in, in kind of when thinking about the new normal? Yeah, and I think this goes back to what Claire just said, right? I mean, it, it's pretty clear now that this experiment of running like such a vast service in a centralized way, you know, it's not gonna, gonna work because the, the local needs uh, are different in different places. And, and so are obviously the needs patients as well. So, you know, in many ways you could argue um, the centralized system hasn't really worked for communities, but the very, you know, sort of one size fits all kind of treatment that many patients have seen in our facilities also hasn't worked because it sort of treats everyone the same. Um, and, you know, there are merits to that. And so what we need to find is this, this happy middle ground where, as Claire said, there is, there is space to be entrepreneurial and innovative locally, and this absolutely has to involve local authorities, right? I mean, I think the, the absence of local authorities in, in a lot of, um, you know, these discussions is concerning um, and, and, you know, needs to be addressed um, quickly. And with that come questions about resourcing. But I think we will only get away with that um, uh, if we have transparency on outcomes. So I think we can have local variation in, in treatment but we should all work to the same um, set of outcomes that we want to achieve. How we achieve them, you know, can be up to, you know, people on the ground. Um, and then issues like ethnic minorities or in fact other, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of groups that may need um, uh, specific treatment um, will become redundant because, you know, unless the outcomes are achieved, something is clearly not going right. Um, and, and so then we need to work on that and understand what that is. And that comes back to transparency, right? So that's why I'm such an advocate for transparency on outcome. And I do think it's a, it's, a, it's a huge excuse in the NHS that we can't do it. It can be done, it has been shown in other parts of the world. We just need to make a concerted effort. So in, in many ways that gives us the license to then operate in different ways locally. We, what we cannot have is that each area does whatever they like, but there's no accountability through transparency on outcomes. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, how, how I would sort of get into it. One other sort of, you know, related point to this is on digital. So I do think that we have gone from one extreme, which was everyone face to face or whatever 80% of, you know, people face to face to the other extreme, where because of the infectious disease that we were dealing with, no one was seen face to face or in physical space and over the phone or digital now. That is not progress in my book, right? And I think George was sort of alluding to it. 
that is a very defensive change that had to happen because no one wants to get infected. A good, a good response is to now find actually a customer segmentation. And I know that's, that's sort of a difficult word, but you know what I mean? It's basically some people will need more face-to-face -face time because they have complex issues and they should get it. And we can afford that because for other um, cohorts, we can actually deal with that over the phone or in digital ways. And they're brilliant examples. They're anecdotal. That's why we need more evidence. But they're great examples where, you know, lots of people have found ways of accessing healthcare over the last two months. And um, when previously they might have gone to A&E or they might have gone to their GP, but they found other ways. And so we, we need to be sophisticated about, you know, which is the right way of interaction for which group. Um, we haven't been. You know, I mean, for all this progress that we're talking about, that hasn't happened yet. And I think that has to be the next step. Can I just interrupt there? Yes, again, please. again, what it does is it exemplifies that unless it's invented in hospital practice, it, it doesn't exist. So, for example, and again, I do have a, co a conflict. We have got ways of segmenting. We have got ways of using electronic consultations and e-triage. It's just it's predominantly in primary care. So a year ago, our organisation was doing 30,000 e-consults a month. We're now doing 30,000 e-consults a day, which, of course, does allow patients to be direct with a closure rate of about 85 percent electronically, which then, of course, allows exactly what Axel is talking about, which allows you to deliver, uh, allows you to direct the patient to the right clinician for the right length of time uh, in the right system and in the right sense of urgency. So. What I would also say going forward is not just learning from local authorities and empowering them, but learning from primary care who have put in, who have over the last 30, 40, 50 years always been ahead of the, the curve in terms of innovation. But because it's in primary care and these enormous institutions called hospitals never want to learn from us and have to reinvent. So two things, learn from, from uh, local authorities or embed some proper resource and time and space, but also let's turn the whole thing upside down and learn from primary care because we have in the past, before we were put in a bureaucratic straitjacket, being able to innovate and develop services for patients in the right level. Our practice, for example, used to run clinics for the Vietnamese community, for Bangladeshi community. We can do it if we give them the right headspace at the right time. And learn from us. So, so Claire, I, I, you know, this wasn't meant as a dig at, you know, primary care. No, I know it's I, not. I just, it. it's, it's just a sort of, let's be cautious before we celebrate, right? This, this transition into digital, we just need to be more, you know, and, and uh, as, as usual, there's a, there's a sort of distribution of, of best practice. And you're quite right to say we should learn from the best. And in many ways, what I'm saying is that that should be inbuilt because what we really measure people against are outcomes, right? And whether you do it one way or someone yeah. else is doing it a different way, who cares? As long as- I, I agree, yeah. Axel, but, but as I said right at the start, we now have hospital consultants having just invented, realized the telephone can be used. Now we, hopefully, the telephone is a very ineffective way of delivering care for all sorts of reasons. So, and you're absolutely right, we have to be outcomes-based. And I loved what you said earlier, which is we, we have to do some sort of research even if it is now backwards because of time into what has worked because if that's not the legacy of knowing what's worked for patients and outcomes then we've lost we've lost all that valuable uh, information and, and and the valuable innovation that's been put in place yeah um thank you so george actually how do you think that we could potentially kind of align the incentives better between primary and secondary care and think about the whole kind of integrated care uh, piece moving forward? That's a really big question, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> um, aligning incentives across the whole of health and care and primary care included. You have um, one minute to solve it, go for it. I'm gonna back up a little bit, just going back to the point about BAM BAME communities, um, yeah. because I think it's, fascinating that it's not just the focus on primary and secondary care and having the impact. I mean, it was during, during the peak COVID, it was more dangerous to live in Brent than it was to go skydiving. You know, there was a higher mortal risk of being in, in that part of London, which I, I think that it's a bigger societal problem that is driving a lot of the, uh, uh, some of the worst outcomes that we're seeing. And I do think it's important when thinking about outcomes to recognize that, you know, that there's a bigger challenge in some areas rather than others. Um, in terms of aligning incentives across primary and secondary care, I mean, that's something that there has been a huge amount of work on over the, you know, the past decade or so 
um, way, way back uh, to the time when PBR was introduced. I, I think generally the, the consensus tried to not overcomplicate it. Um, I think certainly during COVID, you know, focusing on mortality has really sharpened the focus. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that mortality is the only and best outcome measure, but it, it certainly has really sharpened the focus in terms of what's important and getting everyone to sort of uh, focus on the same thing. Um, morbidity and quality of life are, are other key ones. Um, I think the harder, the harder thing somewhat is how you attribute contribution to delivering those outcomes. So how much of that is, you know, Claire's wonderful service delivering a better primary care service or a local authority improving health uh, inequalities in the community or the, uh, the, the acute actually stopping people going over that line and dying. Um, I think that that's, that's almost where some of the really good bits of the past eight weeks can come out, which is this, you know, we literally just all care about mortality and it doesn't really matter whether it's you, you me, you Axel or Claire who's delivering re reductions. It, we just, you know, we just don't want our loved ones to die. Um, I think that would be, uh, that would be my, uh, my starting position. It's a very hard question. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, actually, a, a topic that we haven't um, yet uh, talked about is um, obviously the implications that this pandemic has had um, on the workforce. So both are there things that we can learn from it um, moving forward and also how we're going to be potentially dealing with quite a stressed out burnt out uh, workforce moving forward and what we can do to potentially emotionally um, or I guess support the, their mental health moving, moving forward. Um, so maybe could I go to Claire, then Axel? Yeah, of course. Um, I run a service for doctors, dentists and medical students with mental illness. So in particularly interested in this area. And if we learn from previous epidemics, because fortunately pandemics are pretty rare, the mental health of the workforce is always an issue and it's particularly around what's called moral injury which is having to make decisions that are uncomfortable and cause guilt fear shame and then the mental illness bit which is around post-traumatic stress disorder anxiety and depression so we are expecting something but unlike other epidemics so SARS uh, even HIV and AIDS and Ebola the system has rapidly put in place a sort of comfort blanket around the staff. So rapidly, many trusts, for example, have put in welfare rooms, uh, psychological support on house, and the Thursday clapping, even though hopefully it will end soon, has also shown the appreciation. So I think things are different. And the previous, when an access cell, this is all of us, rather than previous when it was just a few that were involved. So I don't think we should be automatically saying we're going to see a tsunami of, of mental health problems. I really think we need to be very careful about that because we could build up an expectation that wasn't actually there. I think we are going to see excess morbidity, but I think we need to be careful about numbers. If you say, what do I think needs to happen going forward? The reason why so many doctors and nurses became burnt out is because of workload and intensity of workload. And what's happened with COVID paradoxically is that the workload has reduced. It, 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 the, the hours people are working, though they're very intense, the actual workload because of the ex extraneous has reduced. So I think we need to maintain that if we're honest. I think we also need to maintain what's, what's worked in terms of trust, which is spaces where staff can have a therapeutic encounter. I don't mean therapy, but I mean a therapeutic encounter with each other to discuss the emotional impact of their work. And if there's one single innovation that needs to be carried forward, it's the time and space for staff to meet together to talk about their work. And then we have to pick up the pieces that, that happen at the edges. So doctors, nurses, staff who become mentally unwell. Fortunately, doctors have my service. I wish nurses had a similar service because I think they're going to bear the brunt of a lot of the mental health problems for various reasons. But I mean, that's it in a nutshell. It's, it's more complex than that, but that's probably what I would say for now. Axel, do you have any further thoughts on this question? So, so, let, so all of that, you know, I recognize, and I think it's really, really important. Um, let, let me come to this from a slightly different um, perspective, which is, um, 
you know, there, there are all kinds of questions being raised about whether um, the virtual world is the one that we should be in going forward and whether we actually need offices. Um, you know, I, I certainly hear a lot of, of that conversation going on about um, the administrative, the sort of support service space where people talk about, um, you know, real estate being redundant, it's very expensive, do we really need it, we can all work from home. And obviously, you know, like many others on this call and probably in the audience, organizations have had to go from, you know, one day to another to remote working, right? We do it as an organization at Imperial College Health Partners. And it's been fantastic on one level, but it's also been unbelievably challenging on a, on a different level, right? Um, not, not least um, because we can't be in the same space, not least because, you know, schools weren't open and people have been facing you know, double challenges of, you know, having to work as well as doing the childcare, as well as running a household and, you know, having kids run around. I'm surprised I haven't seen a kid on this call yet. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 again, like the digital, I think we, we, we must not go from one extreme to another extreme without being a bit more thoughtful about when is virtual working, for example, um, good, what, what is the office for? So we, we, we have asked in our organization sort of questions about what do we want from physical space? What, why is it important to come together in different ways? Um, so I think this has, this has helpfully raised all kinds of really interesting questions of, of how we work. Um, uh, clinically, obviously, is one aspect, but there's a whole range of sort of support stuff that's wrapped around healthcare. Um, uh, and obviously, these questions apply outside healthcare as well there's a really fruitful discussion that we could have about the future of work and, and the role of office space, um, which is absolutely related to the mental health um, elements that, that Claire has mentioned as well, because not everyone finds this, um, you know, uh, an enjoyable um, experience, especially if you share a flat and, you know, you're working out of your bedroom uh, for several months. Yeah. Um, you know, is that really, uh, you know, um, something that, that should be continued? So, you know, there, there, there are those questions, actually. Um, and, and before we jump to conclusions, I guess, you know, what I said earlier applies here as well. Um, we, we could do with a bit of evidence how, how this has actually worked out. Yeah. No, no, thank you very much for your uh, responses. Actually, now um, moving on to uh, another topic that was asked by um, several attendees, which is that of care homes and the whole social care piece. Um, so I guess the question here is, what do we want to see moving forward, um, given, you know, I guess the, the kind of consequences that the pandemic has had and all of the kind of issues uh, that have been thrown up um, about social care and what has happened to, to care homes. So, George, I will go again to you for the hard question. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely exposed the huge difference between the NHS's ability to um, indicate that there's a problem and get a solution. And I think no one really knew the impact that was happening on care homes by and large until uh, the Office of National Statistics published the mortality data and it became you know, hugely stark how, how, how terrifying the impact was on care homes. There's certainly a, um, uh, it certainly seems that that's partly been driven by the fragmentation of the care home sector, um, less, less formal training and use of PPE or you know, how, to, how to cope with uh, care home residents with, uh, with, that might be infected. Um, there are certainly some, perhaps with hindsight, you know, more testing. I know everyone always says more testing, but certainly more testing of care homes you know, could certainly have helped actually just understand that there's a problem. I think it's also important that it's not just been a UK problem. So lots of people talk about the, the response in Sweden and the positive aspects of the Swedish response and not having to have a full lockdown and having relatively low mortality, although it has gone up recently. Um, but they, they've also seen a really big um, and bad effect on care homes, um, as, as did Spain and, and other, many other countries. So I, I think it's, a, um, it's, not, it's not UK specific, the problem, but there's certainly going almost back to Axel's point around the centralised nature of the NHS allowing a more coordinated response. There's certainly something in there about how the care home bit of social care for sure um, evolves in the future and whether that's just funding or whether it's um, more, more oversight, so I'm, I'm less sure yet. Great, thank you, George. Um, Axel, do you have any kind of reflections on, on this question? 
it's it's so difficult. I agree with what George has said about different examples worldwide. I'm sitting on the fence, right? So I I basically um, I know a lot of people that have celebrated um, how quickly we managed to discharge people from hospital, and you know some of the guidance um, that helped with that, and some of the funding that helped with that. Did we do it too too fast? You know, did did we discharge people that maybe shouldn't have been discharged? Um, we can speculate, right? We we probably don't have the evidence either way, uh, other than a lot of sort of anecdotal um, evidence. That story needs to be told, right? Either way. So you know, coming back to the learning, um, a sort of you know cold factual analysis of what happened there is is needed, right? Without sort of, um, I mean, I guess this is a general point, um, and I'm as guilty as anyone else in that. It's very hard to jump to conclusions and judge, right? Um, you know. Certainly, um, it, it feels like there have been a lot of missed opportunities over the last two months um, in terms of policy and, and so on. There clearly have been failures. Um, I think we should all, um, uh, and as I say, this applies to myself as well, sort of try to kind of use this as a learning opportunity rather than as a sort of, you know, blaming. But it's harder than, you know, it is quite hard actually to not blame. Um, at this stage, and this obviously the care home stuff is particularly um, difficult in that respect. Um, but at the moment, we we don't really. I I certainly feel I haven't seen the evidence either way. I can I can point to some anecdotal evidence. I can point to some guidance that has been issued. Um, but fundamentally, George is right. There are some some systemic issues here in the care home space, and they need to be addressed. Right, the funding needs to be addressed. We need we need a proper care home uh, social care reform. Uh, we know what the answers are, you know, lots of organizations, including your own, um, you know, have, have published in, in the past on this. Um, we need some political will to make it happen. And maybe this has been the catalyst now to, to kind of make it happen. Uh, great. So I do realize that we're reaching near the end of uh, the event. So actually, I um, will bring this event to a close. And actually, I had a kind of final question uh, for panelists. I actually will let you choose between either one or, or of, of two questions. Um, so one would be if, uh, I guess, what would be at the top, and this would be a kind of single factor, of the priority list that you would give to government when thinking about the future of the NHS? Um, or uh, do you think that the long-term plan actually still makes sense and would it need updating? So I will start with Claire um, and then go, go around. Yeah, I'll, I'll choose a long-term plan as that's my brief as co-chair of the NHS Assembly. Of course it needs updating because if you look at it, I'll give you a very brief example. I think one of the targets was by 2025, and this might not be exact, but you'll get my gif, drift. By 2025, 15% of trusts will use digital. Well, we've now overwhelmingly surpassed that. So, of course, it will need refreshing. Of course, it will need a, a relook at the, the overall uh, uh, long term plan was the right thing. But I think it now needs an, another look because some of it we've already through this disruptive innovation. And I don't use, you know, I use those words correctly because this has been disruptive innovation. Uh, have happened already so rapidly. And finally, I would just like to say, but I think the staff in the health and social care system have worked unbelievably well to deliver care and went for their patients. And, and I actually also believe it may be unpopular to say that so have politicians and policymakers. They never set out to do the wrong thing. They set out to do the right thing. If it turns out to be the wrong thing, then we'll learn from it, as Axel said. But I think it's a big thank you to everybody that's got us at this point. Of course, there have been errors made, in particular, I think, around care homes. But let's just actually say thank you to those vast numbers of people who have spent the last 12 weeks working tirelessly for us. Thanks, Claire. George, can I go to you? So I, I, I will... The thing I would most like to see change would be more visibility and transparency and better data. It still drives me nuts that the recording of mortality deaths from COVID-19 seems to drop every weekend randomly as if people aren't actually dying the weekend, which clearly they are. Um, and I, I think that's a general over the entire, you know, the more visibility we have, and this isn't just England, but Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. I think the better ability we've got to spot where the problems are and the opportunities are for improving them. I think in, in the, the much, in some ways, the much harder bit after that is then how to solve that problem. And 
I think that that's where the NHS has to stop looking at just an NHS solution for what is perceived to be an NHS problem when clearly it's a much bigger problem than, than just the NHS. Thanks, George. Axel? Yeah, I guess I would say that um, it, it, my advice to, to the policy space would be to seek a different, a different contract with the public in terms of, of, of healthcare and not just the NHS, but you know, broad, broader, because there's now sufficient evidence that um, we can have a completely different relationship between the citizen and public services. Um, whether that is in the design of, of them or in the decision-making of you know, what, what services should do, or in fact, in the running of services. And, and I feel there's a very you know, interesting um, creative space. Um, and the last two months have shown that again, right? The relationship that the public has developed with the NHS, I totally agree with Claire, just clapping has to stop. And you know, we have to sort of move on from that into a more thoughtful space now. Um, but that would be my advice, explore that space. Um, uh, uh, because we, we can only do this in partnership. We cannot do this as a service to patients. We have to do this as a service with patients. Um, that, that is the space I would pick. Uh, so thank you very much and I would like to apologize to uh, the attendees whom, whose questions we, we haven't answered. I tried to get through as, as many as we possibly could, uh, given the allotted time that we had um, on this event. So to conclude, uh, we said so yes, the NHS long term plan will need updating. There is a plea for better data and for a different type of social contract between uh, patients, the public and the healthcare system. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us today and thank you so much to our amazing panelists for this really fantastic discussion. Uh, just one last piece of information from me. Reform's next uh, online event will be held on the 8th of June. It will be on a completely different topic, but we'll be looking at uh, the justice system after the lockdown and how they will be uh, dealing with their incredible backlog of uh, court cases, amongst other things. Uh, we have some brilliant speakers confirmed for that event, uh, such as uh, David uh, Lamy and Kieran Mullen and other, other panelists um, to be confirmed quite soon. And one final note, um, actually, George and I uh, have been working in partnership on a paper trying to address the question uh, that we posed to our panelists today. So looking at, you know, what are the next steps for the NHS uh, building a more uh, resilient uh, healthcare system. So please do watch this space. Um, we will be publishing relatively soon um, and it will all be posted um, on our website. So thank you very much thank again. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ellie. It's been great. Thanks for having us. And Axel and Claire. Take care. And thank you, Axel and George. Lovely meeting. And all the participants who we can't see yeah. and may never see. <laughs> <laughs> they never see. You know, that's why I think Axel is right. I'd rather see you all, participants. Bye. Bye. It is odd. It feels Bye. like it's kind of just. Bye. Bye. Yes. Bye. <laughs>